Welcome to church. It's so good to be with you today. Whether you're in the room or you're joining us online, it's so good to be with you. My name is Chris. I'm up here with Donnell. And a special welcome to you. If this is your first time here, hey, it takes a lot of courage to step into someplace new. And we're so glad that you did. We want you to know that this is a place where you belong. We're so thankful that you're here today. And we're going to do some singing together. And we sing and we worship every single week because we believe that something powerful happens when we do because of the name that we are singing to and the name that we are singing about. And that name is Jesus. The name of Jesus has the power to restore broken things. The name of Jesus has the power to heal the hurting parts of who we are. The name of Jesus has the power to cast out fear. That's who he is, that's what he does. And when we worship together, we're inviting him into our lives, into our circumstances. We're making a decision to put him above everything else. And when we do that, we're given a hope and a confidence that only comes from Jesus. So I'm gonna invite you to stand with us today as we sing of the power that is found in the name of Jesus and worship him for who he is and for what he's done. We're so glad that you're here. Let's sing this together. There's power. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name.
friends. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for who you are today. That you came into this world to bring freedom, to bring hope, to restore what was broken. And God, I know for each and every one of us in this room, we've had seasons of life where it feels broken. Maybe we're in a moment today where we need your healing. We need the power that comes from your name here in this moment, here today. So Jesus, I pray over every single person who is watching, who is in this room today, that we would know that there is a hope and a freedom that is found in your name that has the power to heal, it has the power to restore. So would we recognize who you are today? That when we worship you, we are putting you above everything else in this life. And when we do that, you do something in our hearts that only you can do. And so Jesus, today, we just say, have your way. We thank you for the power that is found in your name and what you have done for every single one of us today. No matter where we've been in this life, no matter what we have done, your love is for us, it is with us. And would we just receive it today? And would our response to that just be thank you and worship? So Jesus, I thank you for the people here today, for their story. Teach us something new about who you are. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for singing today, everybody. You can have a seat. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Eagle Brook Online. So glad that you could join us. My name is Jeff Dodge. I'm the online campus pastor. And a couple of weeks ago, my best friend Daniel, who's also a pastor at Eagle Brook, went with our families on a weekend getaway to a small town in Wisconsin, which was just a couple of hours away. And when we got there, our kids really wanted to swim. And so we got the towels and all the pool things ready. And then we walked down to the pool area. Our kids were swimming. The adults were in the hot tub. And we had the whole place to ourselves until a couple that lived there walked in and joined us. We struck up a conversation with them, asking for recommendations on local places that they love, and among their list, they had mentioned a church they attend. And while being in a hot tub with two pastors, naturally, Daniel and I asked them questions about their church experience, and then they asked about ours. And we told them we'd go to a church called Eagle Brook, and he got this big smile on his face, and he says, we watch Eagle Brook online quite a few times. His sister had told him about Eagle Brook and she attends every week. And I said, that's awesome. What campus does she attend? And he said, oh, she lives in New Richmond, Wisconsin. She doesn't attend in person. She attends online. And as he said that, he started to put together that I don't just attend Eagle Brook, but I'm the guy who does this every weekend. And we had a good laugh and it was a cool connection, but it got me thinking about a couple of things. First is that online attenders are everywhere. And secondly, is that his sister's story is similar to many of you. You live far away from our campuses, and yet you would consider Eagle Brook Church to be your home, the same way that we would consider you part of our church. And our online team spends a lot of time thinking up ways that we can connect our online attenders together because as a church, it's critical that we don't just watch a service on the weekend, but that when you're ready, you take steps to get connected in the community here. And for some, that could be after the first time attending. For others, that might take a little bit. But one of the most successful ways that we've connected people online is through mid-sized groups. They're held over Zoom, they're five weeks long, and the one coming up is on five values to live by, which is our church's five values. Each week, we'll learn about one of the values, and then we'll break out into smaller groups and have time to connect and discuss. The first session starts on November 15th at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time and is an hour long. You can sign up at eaglebrookchurch.com slash groups and click on the Find a Mid-Sized Group button. With that, Ryan has the message for us as we wrap up our series, Attacking Anxiety. Enjoy the rest of the service. Well, hey everyone. I'm guessing many of you have been spending this weekend either reducing the deer population or at least supporting those who do. Either way, thanks for spending some time with us. I'm excited to tell you about next weekend. On November 11th and 12th, Senior Pastor Jason Strand will be talking about where we believe God is leading us as a church in the future. We're calling it Vision Weekend, an opportunity to relay the vision that God has given us for this church. So please make it a priority to be here or join us online next weekend. But today we've got Ryan Leak bringing week two of our series, Attacking Anxiety. Last week we talked about how anxiety is a multi-layered, 
complex enemy that we can attack on many fronts. It's never easy, it takes a lot of work, but we've been praying for God to break those contracts with anxiety. Ryan picks up the conversation today, zeroing into some further tools that God provides us in our attack against anxiety. So please welcome Ryan Leake. Welcome to Eagle Brook Church. We are so glad that you are here. We have been talking about attacking anxiety. When it comes to anxiety, there's levels to it, right? I mean, there are some things that can cause all of us a little bit of what I would call low-level anxiety that you and I probably could look back at some situations and some circumstances that we would look at our reaction to them and consider them an overreaction, perhaps the situation wasn't worth the angst we gave it. Uh, perhaps we might even look back at some low-level anxious moments in our lives, and we might actually look back and, and laugh at them. For example, uh, our response at times to no or bad Wi-Fi, ah, I mean, we could just lose it. We look back and go, you know what? Probably an overreaction or uh, the person that's looking for their keys all over their house and it was in their pocket the whole time or uh, the person that's uh, looking for their phone with their phone in their hand. You just kind of look at these things. You go, hey, you, you probably overreacted. Now, these are circumstances where uh, the stakes are rather low, but then there's what I would call mid-level anxiety. Um, this is like uh, being in a public restroom going number two and realizing there's no toilet paper, <laughs> that's a problem, okay? Like, like that, the stakes are a little bit higher. It's not going to ruin your life, but you're up a creek, okay? So that's, that's we, got, we got to talk about that. Like, um, or uh, if you've uh, ever accidentally, you know, screenshotted a text message with somebody, and then you accidentally sent it to that same person, <laughs> So you're screenshotting the screenshotter, and it's just getting kind of weird. Like, like you just, you, there's, you're going to have a little bit of anxiety there. Um, or I don't know if you've ever been on Zoom, and you thought you were on mute, but you were on loud. <laughs> and I had a friend the other day that they were on Zoom, and they thought that they had video off and sound off, and, you know, it was 20 people on the Zoom, and. They got in a fight with their spouse, and, you know, somebody's texting them like, hey, you're not on mute, you know? So, um, and maybe for you, mid-level anxiety comes in the realm of parenting. Um, I don't know if you've ever temporarily lost a child at the mall or Walmart. Uh, I haven't. I was just wondering if you did, and... <laughs> I don't know if you call 911 or what the protocol is there, but there's some, there's some real, real anxiety there. Um, I, I get mid-level anxiety from watching our two boys by myself because, uh, not because they're challenging, it's just that when my wife leaves the house, I use this arrogant phrase, I got this. And sometimes I don't. And so, but I know that when she comes home, she's going to want a detailed report of how the watching of the children went. And thinking about the report is what makes me anxious because now I have to make sure that there's no story to tell when she walks through the door. And so a couple years ago, uh, I was watching the kids by myself. I was managing one on this room, and then in the other room, I just hear crunching, and I'm like, okay, that's not good because I didn't feed him yet. And so I go in, and I see him chewing on downy beads, fabric softener, like they were Skittles. He's alive. Relax. Um, <laughs> and another time, he went to a plant. He thought it was chocolate. Just started eating dirt, and I'm just like, and here's the funny thing. I don't know if I was more concerned for the child or me, you know? Because I'm like, she's going to kill me when she walks through the door. And then she comes through the door, and she instantly wants, you know, this report. Hey, how'd it go? It's fine. The kids are alive. They're terrific. And then she asked this question. Well, what'd they eat? Why are you asking these judgmental questions right now? I don't appreciate how you're coming at me, guns hot. You just walked the door. Hi, honey, how was your day? Like, I, like something else. They, they're fine. They had a number one from Chick-fil-A with a side of downy and dirt. Leave me alone. Like, I mean, these are things, it's just mid-level anxiety. But then there... 
There, there is a level of anxiety that is absolutely crippling. This is high level anxiety. This is this goes beyond uh, being stressed before you have to take a big test. Now, this goes beyond uh, the anxiety you might feel when you're getting ready to go on a first date. This goes beyond the kind of anxiety that you might feel going into a, a job interview. No, th this, is, this is crippling anxiety. Compound stress over decades can take you there. Wearing multiple hats for one company can, can take you there. A, a car accident can take you there. Trauma can take you there. A war can take you there. Uh, there there's a, a friend of mine who went on a guy's trip uh, this summer. I mean, they were supposed to be having the time of their life. And unfortunately, on this trip, he had three panic attacks. And the third one hospitalized him. This is a guy who makes good money, he's got a beautiful family, and yet found himself in the middle of the night struggling to breathe. And thank God another one of my friends just so happened to be sharing a room with him, and he was able to reach out and grab him and help him get to the hospital. This is actually, ironically, one of three friends I've had in the last six months that have had a level of anxiety that have led them to an emergency room. Now, here's the deal. I, I don't know what level of anxiety you're dealing with or have had to deal with in your lifetime, but this is what I want each and every one of us to know. There's hope. There's hope in a God. There's hope in a man named Jesus. There's hope in his power, not your power, not my power, but in his power, I, I believe things can change. And I do want us to be realistic today because you're probably not going to hear two 30-minute sermons on anxiety and never deal with it again. But in this series that we've entitled Attacking Anxiety, we're not prescribing an anxiety cure-all. We're prescribing a fight. We're prescribing the idea that you and I should go on offense when it comes to anxiety. And it may be a fight. It may be a struggle that we have to manage for the rest of our life. But what we want to do today is we want to equip you to fight. Now, for me, I work out almost every single day. And... I hate it. I hate it with the passion, okay? I do not like getting up early and going to the gym. I don't like sleeping in and going to the gym. In fact, sometimes I go to the gym just to walk around so I can tell people I went to the gym, okay? <laughs> but getting to the gym, it puts me in a position to be the person I want to be. Um, I drink a, a green smoothie, a green drink every single morning. And guess what? I hate it. It's nasty. I don't like salads. I think it's pointless to get dressed up with my wife to go to a nice restaurant or only to order a quinoa salad. Who does that? No, you might as well be eating downy beads and dirt. Listen, I love food, okay? I love food. I love fast food, I love slow food, I love frozen food, I love food. And every single day, it is a fight for me when it comes to being healthy. And I believe it's going to be the same thing for all of us when it comes to our spiritual health and when it comes to our mental health. It's going to be a fight. So, so whether you're a, a Christian or not, a church person or not, guess what? Anxiety in some way, shape, or form is coming to our front doorstep. And I think that it's time that you and I stop being reactive to anxiety. And we start going on the offense and say, you know what? I'm actually going to be 
proactive. And I just got to encourage somebody. If anxiety has taken over your life, I just want you to know that anxiety does not have to be the boss of your life. And I believe with all of my heart that God brought you here this weekend for a reason. In fact, I think the person who sent you the link to this message loves you a lot. And they think that you can overcome anything. Now, when it comes to anxiety, there are a lot of things that are what I'd like to call uncontrollables. Uh, this is other people's actions and choices. This is natural disasters. This is global events, the economy, the news, the weather, traffic. There is nothing that you can do about any of that. There's some chaos that is absolutely unavoidable because you live on planet Earth. But today's message is all about the controllables, the hard things that are well within our control to help us go on offense when it comes to anxiety. Today, I want to cover four things, four things that I think we can control to help us attack anxiety. The first thing is this. Um, the thing that I think we can control is, number one, uh, where we give our attention. Where we give our attention. I love what Proverbs 20, verse 20 says. It says this, says, my son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them, and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. I want us to notice the words ears, sight, and health in this text. And I want to encourage us this weekend to be incredibly mindful, and dare I say strategic, about what goes through our eyes and in our ears. Because the reality is, is you can't control the news, but you can control how much you watch the news. Uh, you can't control what other people post, but you can control who you follow. You can control who you mute. You can control your phone. You can delete apps. I, I was going to lunch with a friend the other day, and, and, and I sent him a link uh, to two restaurants via Yelp. I said, hey, which one of these do, do you want to go to? And he said something that was very bizarre. He says, hey, man, I... I can't open these links. And I said, I said, why? He said, well, actually, I, I've been going through the process of turning my smartphone into a dumb phone. And so he's actually removed all internet working apps off of his phone. And as he was just talking to me about this process, he just said, man, my phone is running my life. And I just don't want it to anymore. I just have so much freedom. So if, if I need the internet for something, I'll just use my laptop. But for him, is he, he's basically got a BlackBerry from 1995, and so which is I'm just like hey, it's an expensive dumb phone. But nevertheless, he just he took control instead of it controlling him. Because I know what can happen for you and I is like we could just be on our phones and we could just be scrolling social media, and in just 30 seconds we can go through an array of emotions that are just wild. I mean, because you can just be sitting there and, and swipe one. The world on the brink of World War III. You're like, oh my god, oh my goodness. Swipe two. Vikings quarterback out for the season. Oh shit, man. Achilles, be careful out there. Stretch, you know. Swipe three, friends on vacation. You're like, I need a vacation, man. I need a break. <laughs> Lucky them, man. I got to get out of here. This is crazy. Swipe four, a mom showing the arts and crafts project she did for her kids' whole class while the background of her, is her living room and it's spotless. Your house is a mess and <laughs> forgot to pack a snack for your kid. You know, it's just like, oh, man, I just... <laughs> School's calling, Johnny's hungry, you're like, it's your fault, I don't know, send him some dirt, it's like, I don't know, it's like, <laughs> swipe five, your friends posting their workout video, you're like, dude, who's filming you right now, this is crazy, <laughs> dude, 
Did you bring a videographer to the gym? Like, did you bring a stand? Like, you look great, but it's just... And now what? We feel great about the world and ourselves and our home. No, it's like in just 30 seconds, the internet can be overwhelming. And now there's a lot of social media platforms that have what they call, I just find this very interesting. They call it a for you page. This is what they've curated just for you. And I think at some point, You have to ask, is it really for you? Better question. Is it good for you? Because when we take inventory of what has the most of our attention right now and what's going through our eyes and in Our ears, we all have to wonder if any of it is actually feeding anxiety instead of attacking anxiety. Question, when when it comes to what has the most of your attention, does God's word have any of it? I I can just speak for me. I've just made the mistake of desiring big results from God while giving him the smallest of my attention. And the reason I I love the Bible so much is because when you can't hear God, you can read God. And and this is what I I want, you know, God has something that he wants to say to you, that he wants to say to me, that I think you and I should keep in front of our eyes. And do as best as we can to get it in our ears. In fact, I was meeting with some of the people that own BibleGateway.com. And it was an interesting conversation. And they shared with me the number one Bible verse that's looked up on their website. And it's this one. And I think it's one that we should give our attention to. And it's Philippians 4 verse 6 that simply says this. It says, do not be anxious about anything. No, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now, when I read this, I, I think one of the ways that we attack anxiety is by giving our attention to God. Because I, I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me. I, I'm prone to give my attention to my problems. And I think it's verses like these that give us a reminder that there are things that we're often holding on to that God wants to carry for us. The other thing I see when I see this scripture is the second thing that I think we can control that helps us attack anxiety. And that's that we can control, uh, number two, uh, what we're grateful for. What we're grateful for. I love what this scripture says. It says, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. I just want you to think about that for a minute. Let's just say you've got this massive situation that you need to take to God. I just think the Apostle Paul, the writer of this scripture, I think he's brilliant. Because he's going, before you present this massive request to God, do so with thanksgiving. Which means I actually have to Pause my anxiety for a minute to be grateful to God. And here's what's funny. As you're busy being grateful, the massive request you had doesn't disappear, but it does get smaller because you're busy being grateful. Uh, Daniel Young, uh, who I talk about a lot in sermons, uh, he's a, the central youth pastor here at Eagle Brook Church. Um, he, if you're a good friend to a teaching pastor, you're going to end up in sermons. That's just how it is. So, uh, Daniel, the other day, he sent me a text and he said, uh, Hey man, I just, I just got a couple of questions for you. What are three things in your life worth being grateful for? And why are you grateful for them? And I just thought, you only want three? Like, like dude, I, <laughs> where do we start? And this is where I wrote back, living in America, 
It's awesome. I love it here. Uh, healthy kids, healthy spouse, loving spouse, good looking spouse, supportive spouse. We're just at my spouse and we're just getting started, you know? Um, I, I get to preach the gospel of Jesus and I'm not persecuted for it. In fact, I'm rewarded for it, which is absolutely insane. I get to write books. I can speak in corporate America, make a difference in people's lives. I'm healthy. I can still dunk. Praise God for that. <laughs> my mom, my brothers, my shoes, love shoes. Thank you, Lord, for shoes. <laughs> running water, running hot water. My kids' smiles. My friends are unbelievable. It's like I could do this all day. Now, but here's, here's what's interesting. I sent this text back to Daniel on a very, very stressful day. And, and here's what's funny. I don't even remember what was stressing me out. <laughs> it's not that whatever it was just disappeared. It just wasn't worth my attention because what I'm grateful for simply outweighed what was stressing me out. And so I got to encourage you to look for something to be grateful for this week. Um, one of my favorite characters in scripture is a guy named Elijah. Uh, he's an Old Testament prophet. And in scripture, uh, there's Jesus uh, when it comes to miracles, signs, and wonders. Number two is Elijah. This dude was no joke. At one point, he outran a chariot 20 miles. Through the power of God, Elijah literally turned into Captain America. Like this dude <laughs> was the bomb, okay? But then there is a season of his life where he actually defeats all of his enemies' prophets, and an evil queen puts out a bounty for his life. And, and here's what 1 Kings 19 says happened. It says, then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and, and left his servant there. But he himself, when a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he asked that he might die, he's suicidal, saying, it is enough now, O oh Lord, take away my life for I am no better than my father's. Captain America is on the struggle bus. The miracle working prophet is exhausted and overwhelmed by death threats, sitting under a tree. And he should be. But this should also encourage you, and it should encourage me to know that you can be super Christian and super overwhelmed at the exact same time. This series uh, is based off of a book called Attacking Anxiety, written by a pastor named Sean Johnson who just so happened to be my youth pastor growing up. And uh, he's now a friend. And what I love about his story is that he had to push past a lot of stigmas about anxiety in order to be able to share his story so that he can help other people with theirs. And people said all kinds of things about him. You're the pastor of this large church in Denver and and yet you struggle with anxiety. And, and I just love that he leaned into it instead of what some of us might be tempted to do, which is to try and hide it in fear of what other people will think about us. So the good news for all of us is that any one of us is susceptible to being attacked by anxiety from super prophets in the Bible to pastors, to moms, to dads, to CEOs, to lawyers, doctors, engineers. Any one of us, any day, could find ourselves in an Elijah-like situation. Now, I want you to see what happens next in the story of Elijah. And it says this, it says, and, and he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones 
and a jar of water? And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. I told you earlier, I like food. So you know this verse caught my attention. Does this say cake baked? Like, wait a second now. Like, I don't know if you're a dessert person or not, but I am. I love cake. Sometimes I love cake too much. I've had a lot of cake in my lifetime. I don't know if I'm proud of that or not, but I will tell you. As much cake as I've had in my life, I have never had cake door dashed from heaven to my house. This is crazy. (laughs) I mean, if I could sit under the broom tree with Elijah for just a minute, I would say, hey, man, (laughs) we on the run, man. It's crazy out here, man. They trying to kill us. (laughs) It's stressful. I mean, yeah, man, it... It's crazy that an evil queen would try and take your life, Elijah. But isn't it even crazier that God cares about you enough to send you cake? And then I would eat a bite of the cake and say, listen, listen, we're going to die. We might as well eat good while we're here, bro. Come on. (laughs) Here's what I believe in my heart. The difference between experiencing anxiety and fighting anxiety is the perspective that we have on what we're facing. We can focus on the queen, or we can be grateful for the cake. Uh, Here's what I know about you, and here's what I know about me. We all got cake somewhere in our life, and we ought to be grateful for. I know that you have a lot of things in your life that, that you should be anxious about, but I would argue you have more in your life to be grateful for And guess what? That's something that you can control. You ought to write some stuff down this week that you're grateful for. And maybe it's not just stuff. Maybe it's people. Because you go, you know what, man, this person, (laughs) man, it's, it's been so frustrating. And sometimes you can only focus on that person that you forget that there's a whole group of people that are incredible in your life that you ought to be grateful Four, which leads me to the third thing that I think we all can control when it comes to attacking anxiety. And that's that I believe that we can control, number three, uh, how we talk about our problems. How we talk about our problems. I want to show you Psalms 141, verse three. I believe this verse was written just for me. It says, set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. I need a full-time security guard to be a guard over my mouth. Um, here, here's another good one that, that I think is good. Uh, Ephesians 4, 29, it says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. I would also add, uh, what is helpful for building you up according to to your needs, the conversation you're having with yourself so that it may benefit those who listen, even if that's you or the one listening to you. Because sometimes the verbiage and phrases that we've adopted to talk about our problems are, I'm drowning, I'm swamped, can't catch a break, I'm at my wit's end, I'm stretched too thin, I'm spread too thin, can't keep my head above water, I'm on the verge of a meltdown. I'm overwhelmed. I'm in over my head. It's a storm I can't weather. And and while those statements can be true and authentic, I just want you to know two things can be true at the same time. I'm not asking you to pretend like something isn't overwhelming you. I'm asking you to be intentional with your words because what you say matters. You're looking for words that Ephesians describes that are a benefit for you and others. Words that are helpful for building up. So let me ask you this. Is it crushing you or are you crushing it? Two things can be true. Are you on the verge of a meltdown? Or are you on the verge of a breakthrough? Two things can be true. At the same time, I just look at a lot of people who are crushing it. 
and they just can't see how well they're doing. Your situation may be overwhelming, but your words have the power to overwhelm that which is overwhelming you. You could say, I've got a lot of challenges right now, and that's true, but you also could say, I've got a lot of opportunities to grow right now. Both are true, but only one helps you attack anxiety. You can say, I'm just stretched too thin, or you could say, my capacity is far greater than it was five years ago, and now I'm doing things I never thought I was even capable of doing. A guy reached out to me about a month ago and was asking me for some advice, and he used this phrase to describe uh, infidelity in his marriage. He said, Ryan, I destroyed my family. I destroyed my family. He unfortunately committed adultery and was incredibly down about it. And he just said, man, I just, I just don't know what to do next, man. I, I destroyed my family. And I, I said, man, I, I'm really sorry to hear that. I, I'm not a marriage counselor, I, but I, I would just encourage you with this in terms of what you need to do next. One, I, I think you need to just change your language. And he said, what, what, what do you mean? I, I, said, I said, you said that you destroyed your family. And I asked him this question. I said, are they alive? He said, yeah. I said, well, then they're still standing and, and so are you. So let's just give you new language. You ready? You're rebuilding your family. There's a difference. Both might be true. Yes, you messed up. Yes, you need to ask for forgiveness. Yes, you need to go to counseling. Yes, there's a lot of stuff that you need to do. And the journey ahead for you is very, very long. However, the conversation you have with yourself is so important. You are rebuilding your family. And when you use that phrase, you know what it gives you? Hope and a future. The other one says it's completely over. And I said, and I can't promise you that there's just going to be all of these happy days and you're just going to be on vacation soon. But when you begin to use that phrase, I'm rebuilding my family, you're looking forward. You're not looking in the past. You can't control all of the circumstances that come your way, but you can control how you talk about those circumstances. The last thing that I think we can control in attacking anxiety is I think that we can control, uh, number four, uh, who we ask for help. Uh, Proverbs eleven fourteen says this. It says, where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. If we're going to attack anxiety, we can't do it alone. Uh, it may mean going to a doctor, a therapist, a pastor, a trainer. Exercise helps. But no matter what you do, just know that it's going to take a village, a community of people that we can reach out to to help us fight anxiety. And this one's hard. Because the irony of dealing with anxiety is you can get more anxiety thinking about reaching out to people to tell them you're struggling with anxiety. And we also don't want to ask for help because we're not sure how other people will handle our anxiety. I don't know if you've ever had somebody diminish your anxiety via comparison. You're overwhelmed with two kids. They have seven. They look at you like, get over it. You're fine. Quit crying. Uh, when you're single and you use a phrase like, I'm exhausted, married people with two kids just look at you like, exhausted from free time? We'll pray for you. Like, what are you, what's, what's, uh, are you okay? What's going on? We're not sure. Here's what I can guarantee you. On the journey of seeking a multitude of counselors and a community of people to help you fight anxiety, there will also be a multitude of responses. And not all of them will be perfect. I just, I want to encourage somebody today who's watching, who's listening to this message, who's had a lot of relational tension that makes this last asking people for help thing incredibly difficult. And maybe you showed up here today 
just guarded. Walls up. Can I encourage you to, to just pray about bringing your guard and your walls down long enough for somebody to help? For that to happen, you're going to have to trust again. And maybe the last time you did that, it did not work out. But remember, every, every new connection is a chance for a fresh start. And just as seasons change, so do people and so do circumstances. So don't let past disappointments keep you from making new connections. Who knows? The right help and the right support might just be around the corner. I believe if we're going to attack anxiety, I have to wonder who we might need to invite on the journey with us. And my guess is that it's going to be a multitude of people that help us in this fight. We can't control a lot, but we can't control, number one, where we give our attention, what we allow to go through our eyes and in our ears. We can't control, number two, uh, what we're grateful for. I hope you look for cake this week. We can't control, number three, how we talk about our problems. Is it crushing you or are you crushing it? And number four, we can't control who we ask for help. My hope today is that you would find yourself in a posture where you are not simply responding to anxiety, but that you go on offense, that you take the proactive approach to say, I will not let anxiety be the boss of my life. And while there are so many things outside of my control, I have made a conscious decision that the things that are well within my control, I am going to give my absolute best to and that, my friends, is how I believe that you and I can attack anxiety. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to look at your word today. I know that there are so many people watching and listening that have crippling anxiety. And Lord, I, I pray for my friends today that you would give them the strength to reach out to perhaps a multitude of people to be able to be vulnerable enough to ask for help. And Lord, would you, would you give us your perspective through all of this? I pray, God, that we would look around for the things that we can be grateful for and, and that with thanksgiving in our hearts that we would be able to present our requests to you and that you would hear us and that you would indeed help us. Lord, help us to be the kinds of people that are proactive, that go on offense when it comes to anxiety. I pray that we would not let anxiety be the boss of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Hey, our prayer team is going to be down here at the front. Uh, we'd love to pray with you if you have anything that you need prayer for. And we'll see you next weekend for Vision Weekend. Have a phenomenal week.